Amen. Thank you, Pastor Bill and Carrie. We are blessed, aren't we? Each week. So grateful for all of our pastoral ministry team, week in and week out. I'm reminded of all that they do to minister to the body of Christ. They have various roles and responsibilities, but they all see themselves primarily as servants of Christ and servants of His body. I'm so grateful I get a chance to work alongside them. This morning, if you have your Bible, I encourage you to open them to Hebrews chapter 9. We're going to be looking at verses 15 through 22 this morning as we continue our walk through the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 9, verses 15 through 22. As I believe most of you are probably aware, this morning marks the 15th anniversary of the events of 9-11, the attacks on the World Trade Center towers on the Pentagon and the plane that uh, crashed in Pennsylvania. And uh, as I was thinking and praying towards this morning, and I was reminded that there's a lot that has changed in 15 years. But there's still a few things that are very much the same. We know today that God is still in control. Absolutely in control. Sovereign over everything. I was reminded that we're still desperately as a nation in need of prayer. But most importantly, I was reminded that we're a nation that needs the gospel. And we as the church have been called to tell them about the good news of Jesus Christ. So this morning, I wanted to just take a brief moment in prayer and invite you just to pray for our nation, to pray for our president, all of our leaderships, the uh, upcoming elections that will be taking place, but then also to pray for us as the church, that we would be about the mission that God has given to us. So can I encourage you right now where you're seated to just begin to pray for these things that I have just mentioned, and then I will pray for all of us. Father, as we come before you this morning, we come before you very much humbled in your presence, realizing that you are sovereign and you are holy. But we also come confidently, not on our own merit, but through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And in accordance with your word, in obedience to your word, God, we lift up our president, our national and our state and even our local leadership. God, that you would guide them, direct them, and give them wisdom. We pray for our Supreme Court, all of those judges that serve on behalf of the people, God, that you would grant to them wisdom as they make critical decisions during these days. God, we even pray for the upcoming election. God, that you would guide us and give us wisdom as we are encountering new days and difficult decisions. But God, most importantly, I pray for us as a church, and God, that we would never forget our mission and the task that you've given to us, that the greatest need of our nation is not economic and it's not political. It's an issue of sin and the gospel. And God, we've been called. God, you have called us out of darkness and into your marvelous light we've been blessed we've been blessed to be a blessing to share the good news of Jesus Christ and so now more than ever God I pray that you would give us a spirit of courage and boldness God that we would proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ that we wouldn't be ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God into salvation for all those who believe And God, I pray that we would be a display of the unity and peace that can only be found in Jesus. That in this church, that in the body of Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. We are all one in Christ Jesus. So God, as we proclaim the gospel, let them see it in us. 
that we are able to provide something that this world cannot offer and it only comes through the shed blood of Jesus. We pray all of this in Christ's precious and holy name, our Savior and our only hope. Amen. So this morning, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 15 through 22. You know, one of the most cherished emblems of our faith is the cross. We hang it prominently within our sanctuaries. We put it in our homes. It's in a lot of our hospitals. Even today, I was making a hospital visit this week, and a cross was on the wall. We wear it around our necks. It is our cherished symbol of our faith. But what is it about the cross of Christ that causes us to cherish it so deeply? What is it about this emblem of death that we cherish so completely? You know, I believe no passage of Scripture in all of God's Word deals more beautifully with the death of Christ and His atonement than this passage that we're going to look at this morning. It deals with what Christ has accomplished for us in His death, and it also reveals very clearly the necessity of Christ's death for our salvation. This is why we cherish the cross. So would you stand with me this morning as we read God's word together. Hebrews chapter 9 verses 15 through 22. It says there, for this reason he is the mediator of a new covenant. So that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant. Those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. For a covenant is valid only when men are dead. For it is never in force while the one who made it lives. Therefore, even the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. And in the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry with the blood. And according to the law, one may almost say, All things are cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, There is no forgiveness. May God bless the study of his word this morning. You may be seated. So what has Christ accomplished in his death? What has he accomplished in his death on the cross? I want to briefly this morning, as we uh, prepare to enter into a time of taking communion, I want to share with you four things that Christ has accomplished for us in his death on the cross that we see very clearly in this text. The first thing that jumps out to us is that it's through Christ's death that Jesus establishes a new covenant. That it's through Christ's death that God establishes a new covenant. Look at verse 15. He says, for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant. You'll remember, for this reason, looks back to the death of Christ, his atoning death. And in his death, he's become the mediator of a new covenant. It's an amazing statement. This word mediator, it means to stand in the middle, to stand in the gap between two parties. And the difficulty that we have when we think of a mediator is we tend to think of a person who negotiates a compromise. We tend to think of two parties that can't agree. And so the mediator steps in and he's trying to get the the two parties to reach some form of compromise so so an agreement can be made. That's what we tend to think of. But Jesus as our mediator is not trying to mediate a compromise between two equals. He is the mediator between sinful, depraved, and guilty humanity and an infinitely holy God. There can be no compromise in this instance. We are guilty and no amount of compromise is possible. No agreement will be made through negotiation. We are guilty. And all of God's wrath is justifiably pointed at you and me. And what Jesus does as our mediator is he stands in the gap and absorbs the tsunami of God's wrath, the full cup of God's wrath and justice that were poured out on Jesus in his death so that you and I could now go free. That's what it means when it says that Jesus is our mediator. This is not a negotiation for compromise. This is a substitutionary death for our sins. And in his substitutionary death, Jesus establishes a new covenant. 
Essentially, this is a new relationship. In his death, Jesus establishes a new relationship between God and his people. You and I were separated. This was exemplified in the old covenant that man, apart from the death of Jesus Christ and his shed blood, was separated from God. We had no access to God, and without access to God, we had no relationship with God. You remember I said last week in the old covenant, it reminds us, it tells us that God is here, but you are not invited. We are separated apart from Christ's death. Not only were we separated, but we also know that we were at enmity. We were enemies with God. Do you know how God's Word describes you and I apart from the shed blood of Jesus Christ and faith in Him? It says that we are children of wrath, sons of disobedience, and sons of the devil. We were separated, and even beyond that, we were enemies And yet it was Paul who said, but God shows his love for us in this way, in that while we were yet sinners, while we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. Know this morning, Christ died for you when you didn't want him. Christ died for you when you were ungodly, when you were unworthy, even while you were an enemy. And why? Why did he die for you? What did he die to establish So that he could tell us what to do and give us a lot of rules and regulations? No, it says plainly here, he died to establish a new relationship. God sent his son Jesus who absorbed the wrath of God on the cross so that we could enter a new covenant, a new relationship. I love what Ronald Reagan used to say. He says, how do you get rid of your enemies? You just make them your friends. And that is what God did through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus, God got down on our level, died for our sins, and now through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, he extends a hand of mercy and says, come on, come home. Now there's grace. Now there's peace. Now there's forgiveness. Now you can have a relationship with me. What an incredible privilege that you and I have as believers in Christ to have a relationship with Almighty Creator God that we can have intimacy, that we can walk closely with God through faith in Christ. I believe it's why Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, he says, but whatever things were gained to me, I now count as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing, knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Paul, who grew up under the old covenant, who knew all the rules and all the regulations but never had a relationship, said that the one thing that I value in my life more than anything else, in fact, this one thing that I value, it makes everything else look like rubbish. And that one thing that he valued more than anything else was the opportunity to have a relationship with Jesus, something he never had before he encountered Christ. I believe that far too often we take for granted the ability to access God anytime that we want. To come into his presence through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. To enter into prayer. To pick up this book and to know it's God's very word to us. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, he can make it alive and speak into our lives. That we can have a relationship with God through through Jesus, through his word, in prayer, and through the power of the Holy Spirit. Church, how in the world could we possibly neglect and not enjoy something that was so valuable to our Savior Jesus that he died to give it to us? A relationship, a new covenant, a new relationship with God through Jesus Christ, all because Christ died. Secondly, we see here very plainly that Christ's death redeems all those who believe. Christ's death redeems all those who believe. Look at verse 15. For this reason, he's the mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Jesus is the means by which Old Testament saints were forgiven. He says, for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant. And the question that a lot of people ask is, how were Old Testament saints saved? How were they redeemed? Well, the author makes very clear here that they were redeemed by the the blood of Jesus Christ. 
Salvation has always been an issue of faith. It says of Abraham that he believed in God and it was credited to him as righteousness. The only difference was the content of their faith. All they knew was that they were sinners and their only hope was in the grace and the mercy of God to save them and their faith was demonstrated by a life committed to holiness. So the difference is that they believed in a Messiah who would come. You and I believe in a Messiah who has come, but it's all based on faith in Jesus Christ who died. I heard one pastor explain this way, that they were saved on credit that came due at the cross. But without the death of Jesus Christ, all those Old Testament saints would not know redemption and they would not know the forgiveness of God. But then he goes on to say those who have been called. That's you and I as New Testament believers are those who have been called out. In other words, God called us. He took the initiative. If you're here today as a believer in Jesus Christ, it's at some point in your life God called you. You were going about your way, doing your own thing, and God spoke into your life and drew you to himself. You didn't take the initiative. God did. You were dead. That's what the Bible says. You were dead in your transgressions and sins. Dead people don't take initiative. They don't do anything because they're dead. God took the initiative. He came after us. And he gave his son Jesus to die for our sins. And he called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Like Lazarus out of the grave. He called us. Lazarus, come out. Now some of us, he had to call a little extra Chad. Chad, come out. But if we know Jesus Christ, as our personal Lord and Savior, it's because at some point God called us. He drew us. God always took the initiative in salvation and it's pictured in the death of Jesus who he sent to die for our sins to call us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Salvation is a divine act of God. So whether it's an Old Testament saint or a New Testament believer, all of our salvation is based in the cross of Christ where our Savior died. Thirdly, we see in this text that Christ's death secures an eternal inheritance. Christ's death secures an eternal inheritance. Look at verse 15 again. Those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. In his death, Christ has secured for us an eternal inheritance. Look back at verse 12 very briefly. In verse 12, it says, having obtained eternal redemption. That's an eternal payment. Then look at verse 14. He says, through the eternal spirit. He's an eternal person. And now in verse 15, he says, an eternal inheritance See, Jesus is the eternal person who made an eternal payment so that you and I could have an eternal promise. Christ died to secure our inheritance. It's not not just an eternal inheritance. It's a promised eternal inheritance. And what have we learned about God and his promises in the book of Hebrews? We've learned that when God makes a promise, you can write it down and take it to the bank that he will uphold his end of the promise, meaning this is an inheritance that you can count on. It is yours. It is secured for you through the death of Jesus. Maybe you know of someone who didn't receive an inheritance that was intended by a parent because of a faulty will. Maybe you know of someone who intended to leave a large inheritance, but due to a downturn in the market, that inheritance was all but destroyed. Maybe you know of someone who lost their inheritance due to squabbling siblings. You see, man-made wills and inheritance, they can fail, but not our inheritance that God has promised us and Christ has secured for us in his death. In fact, it was Peter who said it this way, that you and I have been born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead to obtain an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith. That you and I have an inheritance through the blood of Jesus Christ that cannot be affected by fluctuations in the market. It's not reviewable by courts. It's not debatable by squabbling families. And no amount of suffering or trials can change it or diminish what Christ has secured for us in his death. There is no way that you and I can possibly fathom all the riches of the inheritance that is ours through the death of our Savior Jesus. 
In fact, Paul stated this way in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived all that God has prepared for those who love them. And all of this is secured for us. How? Through the death of Jesus. But fourthly, and probably most importantly, we see that it's Christ's death that activates the will. It's Christ's death that activates this inheritance. In verses 16 through 24, the author is going to spend seven verses showing us that all these blessings that we've talked about, our new relationship, our cleansing of our sins, our redemption, our inheritance in Christ, all these things would never have been available if Christ hadn't died. Look at verses 16 through 17. He says, For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. For a covenant is valid only when men are dead, for it is never enforced while the one who made it lives. In other words, you don't receive an inheritance until the person bestowing the inheritance dies. So you can have a parent that's extremely wealthy and say, One day it's going to be mine, but you can't touch it until they are gone. So essentially, you and I have all these promised blessings that are out there, and they're ready and waiting to be bestowed and given, but none of it can be activated into our lives until the one who made the covenant dies. That's just the way it works, that you don't get the inheritance until the person who made it dies. That was the message of the old covenant. Look at verses 18 through 22. He recounts the old covenant. He says, therefore, even the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood, For when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and of the goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. In the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry with the blood. And according to the law, one may almost say all things are cleansed with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no forgiveness." God has declared all along that there is no forgiveness. There's no cleansing apart from the shedding of blood. It was the message of the old covenant sacrificial system. It was the the message of the Old Testament that we are sinners. And the only way to be cleansed is through the shedding of blood. And this is difficult for so many people to grasp. There are a lot of pastors, a lot of preachers, a lot of churches that don't even want to mention the blood of Christ. Claiming that it's too gory or too gruesome. Since the time of Christ, it appears that people have stumbled over the death of Christ. That Christ had to die and shed his blood to atone for our sins. You remember it was Jesus when he announced to the twelve that he was going to go to Jerusalem and die. It was Peter who said, God forbid it. That'll never happen. Paul said in Corinthians that the word of cross is, the word of the cross is foolishness to the perishing. And today, liberal theologians hate the idea of Christ's blood paying for our sins. They call such views a slaughterhouse religion. But hear me on this today. If there is no cross of Christ, if there is no blood of Christ, there is no salvation for you and me. There can be no mercy without justice. God could not extend his hand of mercy until his hand of wrath and justice had been appeased and paid for. You might say, well, why is this the case? Well, primarily because you and I are guilty. We are sinners. You might say, well, yeah, we've all sinned. What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is we've sinned against an infinitely holy God who cannot overlook sin. He can't turn a blind eye. He can't just simply wink at our sin and what we've done. You say, well, why can't he overlook sin? He's God. He can do anything he wants. Folks, know this. He can't operate outside of his character. God is gracious, but he is also just. Recently in the news, you probably heard the story of the young man that raped a young girl. And the judge let him off with a very light sentence. And the public was outraged, and justifiably so. A heinous crime had been committed. But what was said about that judge in the giving of a light sentence for such a horrible crime? Did the people say, what a gracious judge. What a good judge. What a kind man. No, they said of that judge that he's evil, that he's corrupt, that he's no longer worthy to judge and to preside over the court. Folks, you and I stood before God as guilty sinners, and if he simply overlooked our sin, he would no longer be good, he would no longer be just, he would no longer be perfect. God's character demanded that your sin and my sin be punished. 
And if God did that, if he left it that way, it would be him being completely just. It would be us getting what we rightly deserve. We sometimes fool ourselves in an entitlement society into thinking that God somehow owes us something, that the government owes us, that our parents owe us, and that God owes us. Folks, God owes you nothing. All that we deserve is death and hell. That is what our sin has earned for it. As the Bible says, the wage of sin is death. But get this, don't miss this. Despite everything you've ever done, in the greatest act of love, mercy, and grace ever known to man, God, who could not overlook our sin because he is just, sent his Son His one and only Son who is perfect and is sinless and is God and therefore He is the only one uniquely qualified to die for the sins of the world and He died on the cross for your sin and for mine. He absorbed the full wrath of God and all of God's judgment that we rightly deserved. And now through the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ on the cross, God is now freed up to lavish us with his love, his mercy, and his forgiveness through faith in Christ. To cleanse us, to free us, to wash us, to forgive us, to give us his Holy Spirit so that we become co-heirs with Christ, children of God who are promised an eternal inheritance. But know this today, all of those things would remain nothing more than a divine tourist attraction had Christ not died for our sins. All of this is available only through the cross of Christ and his shed blood. Isaac Watts, the great hymn writer, as he contemplated the beauty of the cross, wrote these words. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? Were the whole realm of nature mine, that would be a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Can I just give you three takeaways from the cross of Christ this morning? Number one, know this today. God loves you. Never, ever doubt the love of God. I am sick and tired of people saying that God can't be loving if he allows this. And God can't be loving if he allows that. Folks, I'm fairly certain that Christ validated and confirmed the depth, of his lo- the depth of his love for us when he sent his son to die on a cross for our sins. I think that pretty much settles the debate about how much God loves us. How many of you would give your children up for anybody, much less an enemy and a sinner? And yet that's what Christ did for you and me. Don't ever doubt the love of God When you ever begin to get to a place where you begin to doubt the love of God, simply look to the cross where Christ died for your sins. The debate is settled. God loves you. Secondly, don't neglect the relationship that Christ died to secure. Christ died not so that we could join a cult, not so that we could follow a bunch of rules and regulations, although that's part of it. Obedience is part of it. But the basis of what Christ died to create was a new relationship with you and me. So that we could know God, have a relationship with Him. And the basis of any relationship is communication. I always tell couples that communication is the oil of your relationship. Just like a car that can maybe run a little while without oil, pretty soon it'll break down. Your relationships... Without communications, pretty much, pretty soon they'll break down. The basis of our relationship with God is communication. How do we communicate with God? We communicate with God through his word and through prayer. It's really that simple. He speaks to us in his word. We speak to him in prayer. 
Can I ask you, when was the last time God spoke to you and you spoke to him? When was the last time you took time alone just to be with him? How in the world could we neglect something that was so valuable to Christ that he died to give it to us? Don't neglect your relationship with Jesus and the privilege of entering into his word and having him speak to you through the power of the Holy Spirit and you go into his presence and pray. But thirdly and finally, know this. There is no such thing as a crossless salvation. There is no such thing as a crossless salvation. Your only hope this morning is the cross where Jesus bled and died under the wrath of God and according to the will of God for your salvation and mine. And I ask you this morning, have you trusted in him for salvation? Have you placed all of your faith and hope in him for salvation? Know this today. The cross of Christ is your only hope. But if you place your faith in him, can I tell you today, he will become to you your greatest joy. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for the opportunity to look into your word this morning to be reminded of the beauty of Christ's death that accomplished for us our salvation. God, I pray for anybody that's here this morning that maybe doesn't know you, doesn't have a relationship with you. Maybe they've fooled a lot of people, but deep down in their heart they know. Maybe they got a lot of religion. Maybe they've been seeking to follow some rules, but they don't have a relationship. God, I pray that somehow through the power of your Holy Spirit, you would penetrate their heart to show them the depth of their depravity that they have sinned against a holy God. But God, I pray that they would also see the beauty of their Savior Jesus who died for them, that he stepped in the gap as our mediator, taking the wrath of God so that we could come back to you. I pray that they'd place all their faith and trust in you for salvation. And God, you would cleanse them, wash them, free them, and forgive them. And through the power of your Holy Spirit, that they would become a co-heir with Christ with a secured inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, and won't fade away. God, for those of us that do know you, I pray that we wouldn't become so familiar with the cross that we would lose a sense of awe and wonder at the depth of your love for us. And I pray that we wouldn't neglect this salvation and this relationship that you died to give us, that we would not take for granted the opportunity to enter into your presence, to talk with you, the creator of the universe, the one who loved us, made us, and sent his son to die for us, and to hear your voice in your word. God, may we be a people who abide in your presence. Love so amazing, so divine, demands our soul, our life, our all. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. This time, I'm going to invite you to stand with me as we have an opportunity to respond to, to God's word. This is your time. Maybe you have questions about salvation. You'd like to know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. There'll be pastors here at the front who would love to receive you, love to pray with you, share with you how you can know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Maybe you'd like to just pray with somebody. Maybe you say, you know what? I want to unite with Lenexa Baptist Church and become a member of this church family. We'd love to receive you. But know this, this is your time. You'll never regret obeying Christ. So you respond as he leaves.